So before we jump in tonight, guys, just want to ask you, did uh, I know a bunch of you, most, lots of you were here last week. Any of you give a little more thought to what we talked about last week? What maybe that one thing is that God wants to teach you? Maybe that one thing he wants you to start doing this year? Maybe that one spiritual discipline that he wants you to focus in on? Anybody give a little thought to that this week? A couple of you? All right. I know I did, so I, I hope that was maybe the start of something that uh, will grow into this just being a great year for, for some of you spiritually. Well, tonight we're, uh, we're kicking off a brand new series, uh, and I'm excited about it. We're uh, we're in a new year, and so we, we have a new series, and, and so I want to talk about over the next couple months, I want to talk about stories. Any, anybody here like stories? You guys like, like stories? I love to hear stories, read stories, tell stories. I, I just, I love a good story, right? Which uh, I love to work in some stories as illustrations, even into my lessons, which I think some of you know. Um, any of you guys just kind of get lost in a good book. Anybody, anybody do that? You just kind of, yeah, you get in a good book and you just kind of immerse yourself in it just because the story is so good. Listen, stories can be engrossing. They can be exciting. They can kind of manipulate our emotions, right? And, and they, can, uh, they can make us laugh. They can make us cry. I know uh, I've seen a couple people that I thought were crazy because they're just reading a book and then they start laughing and I'm like, oh, I'm crazy or crying. Um, but stories really, I mean, they go back to the beginning of, of mankind, of, of the human race. And, and so many cultures are, are story based. When we travel to Africa, they're, they're, the people we work with are very story based and they're, they're culture for generations and generations is just kids from the earliest times that they can remember they're told stories and so one of the ways that we try to teach over there is through stories because it's just something that they know and and understand and respond to and so they've been used for everything from teaching history to philosophy to life principles stories are really at the core of human experience and they and they link generations right some of you probably have uh Grandparents who've told you stories, right? Stories about their childhood and their experiences. And so generations are linked, passed to the future by stories and, and memories and, and teaching of lessons. And so I think all of this is why Jesus often taught using stories, why he told so many stories. And, and we call uh, many of these stories parables. And so what we're going to do each week over the course of this series called, what guys? Stories Jesus told, pretty self-explanatory, right? Is we're going to look at a parable. We're going to dig into one of the parables that Jesus told. And some of them are going to be, uh, I think, very familiar to you. And some of them, like the one we're going to look at tonight, may be not so familiar. Now, the word parable itself literally means to put things side by side. That's the word in the Greek. That's kind of the, the word picture that's created by that word that we translate into English parable. And so it's really what it is, is it's using a short story or narrative that grabs someone's attention, often in a, in a surprising or unexpected way. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a story that illustrates a truth using comparison or sometimes using a hyperbole or simile. And it's oftentimes the ones that Jesus told were just with everyday kind of people and everyday kind of events. One of the most helpful definitions that I've heard, and I think some of you guys have heard this before, of, of, of a parable is, is that it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Any of you guys heard that before? That's really what it is, right? It's, it's, it's a story that uses kind of the things that were familiar, certainly in the first century, to teach a very important spiritual truth. And so there are more than 40 parables that are recorded in the Gospels. Uh, and, and over one-third of Jesus' teaching that we see in the Gospels is in the form of of parables. And so it was, it was a really important way that Jesus taught. And so I think it's important for us to, to read them, to, to understand them, and to, to learn from them. And so as we, as we look at one of Jesus' favorite teaching methods, we'll discover that parables are extremely practical. And they weren't just practical in the first century. I believe they're, they're very practical to our lives in the 21st century. They make us pause, they make us think, and, and yet sometimes they can be difficult to comprehend. If you read through the Gospels, there's times where the disciples said, you know what, Jesus, we don't get it. (laughs) We heard this story. What does it mean, right? 
And so for us, even nowadays, we read some of these stories and, and, and some of them we, don't, we aren't given the meaning and we don't fully understand the meaning. And so we're going to really try to dig into some of those and try to understand what they mean. After teaching on the parable of the soils, Jesus actually kind of uh, touched on this in Mark chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Look at what he said. He said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but not perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand. So we want to see and perceive. We want to hear and understand, right? And so that's ultimately going to be our, our, our goal as we work through these parables over the next couple months is that we can have the truth of God's Word uh, implanted in us as we perceive it and as we understand it. And so let me, let me tell you guys a quick little story to kick it off, right? Because I think it's appropriate. Um, years ago, when I was in college in Chicago, I worked uh, for the, about my first year and a half in college as a, as a janitor. It was, called, it was called physical plant, but it was really just a, a janitor. And, and uh, so I helped clean the classrooms and a couple of the buildings. And one of them was the, uh, the athletic building, the the gym and where all the the gyms and the um, uh, weight room and they had they had uh, um, racquetball courts and all that kind of stuff in there and, and it was really nice it was actually relatively new when I went to school there and uh, it was it was so nice as a matter of fact that the several of the teams that would come to play the Chicago Bulls would would come practice at our gym on campus and uh, and I remember every time that there was these uh, these superstar NBA players in our in our gym, people would get so wrapped up and just kind of catching a glimpse of them. And there's sometimes the media would show up and they would, you know, be trying to get in there and take pictures. And, and everyone around the building, anyone else who happened to be there in and around the building basically became invisible. And I was just a janitor, right? And so if I happened to be in there cleaning when all these other NBA stars were in there, it was like nobody saw me, right? Because they wanted to see the guys that, that were important, the players who really mattered. And so tonight what we're going to start this series by learning how we can keep serving God even when no one notices, even when maybe we seem invisible, even when we don't necessarily get recognized or, or thanked for the service that we're doing. And so let me, let me ask you guys a question. And, and uh, if you want, if, some of you, if some, anyone has an answer, you can just kind of Shout it out to me, but, but what would you say is the difference between a servant and a volunteer? Anybody have a thought on that? What's the difference, Hayden? Right, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, ultimately, the difference between the two is a servant has a master and a volunteer doesn't, right? As Hayden was saying, the, the, the servant does what their master tells them, whereas a volunteer kind of picks and chooses when and and even whether they want to serve. A servant serves no matter what. A volunteer serves when it's convenient to them. A servant serves out of commitment. Someone, I think, said it well. They said, the servant does what he is told when he is told to do it. The volunteer does what he wants to do when he feels like doing it. And so I think you guys would agree with me and maybe just nod your head if you agree, but I believe that we live in a me first culture. Do you guys agree with that? <laughs> yeah, I see pretty much everybody nodding. We live in a, in, a, in a me first culture that encourages us to think about ourselves above everybody else. As a matter of fact, I, you know, I think a, a word that kind of captures that is the word selfie. We live in a selfie kind of culture where, where we're turning the camera on ourselves instead of those around us, where we're encouraged to be involved more in self-actualization and to be self-reliant more than to think about others. There's actually an entire magazine called Self, right? Have you guys have seen that? But, but it, just in case we start thinking about someone else, we have all these different social media platforms and websites and magazines to, to make sure we know that we need to get the focus back on ourselves, And so because we're so saturated with messages about self, I think it's easy to sometimes bring this mentality into the church and expect the congregation to cater to us and to treat God like, you know, someone who's just supposed to pour out blessings upon us and to to meet our needs. 
But that's not the case in the Bible. That's not really what we see scripturally. What we see that we're supposed to be scripturally is a servant of God. And the word servant in one form or another is actually used over 1,000 times in the Bible. It means that it's a big deal to God, right? And it should be a big deal to us. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, God refers to Moses with these words. He says, my servant Moses, he is faithful in all my house. And then as you work your way through the Old Testament, Abraham, David, and Job are all called servants of God. When, when Paul, James, Peter, and Jude introduced themselves in their letters over in the New Testament, the first thing they did was to identify themselves as servants. Each, each one of these guys tells us who they are. They give their name, right? They say James or, or, or Paul or Jude, and then they say they are a bondservant. They are a servant of the of the Lord God. This is the way they started their letters because this is their fundamental identity. This is who they knew that they were and this should be our identity as well. We're called first to be servants and we're called secondly to serve. And so what I want you guys to understand tonight is as we're going to jump into this parable in just a few minutes is that God doesn't need volunteers, right? What God is really seeking is sold out servants. Listen, listen to these words from, from one pastor. He said, everyone in our church is a servant. Jesus never asked his followers to give a few hours of their day off. He did call them to give everything for the sake of the kingdom. Most church volunteers have to be cornered, coddled, and convinced that their par- participation won't take up too much of their time. The church doesn't need more volunteers who give away spare time. We need servants whose lives belong to the Lord. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 16 challenges us to live as servants of God. And so let me kind of summarize this in a sentence and then we'll look at our parable, which by the way is over in Luke chapter 17. So if you want to start turning there, Luke chapter 17, let me give you guys kind of a summary sentence. When it comes to, to God's perspective, the issue is not whether we will serve, but where we will serve, right? In God's economy and in God's eyes the issue is not whether we will serve but where we will serve and so Jesus one day revealed the importance of steadfast serving and and, and I call it steadfast serving and the and the title is up there at the top because the word steadfast means this it means fixed in direction and firm in purpose fixed in direction and firm in purpose and that's exactly what we should be as servants Now, I should warn you guys, before we jump into this parable, I mentioned it already, that it's not one of the most popular ones, and so uh, a couple people asked me this week which parable we were starting off with, and I... And I met, and I let them know, and they were like, oh, I don't know if I remember that one. (laughs) And that's kind of the, the overall response to this parable is, oh, I don't, don't know if I remember that one, because it's short, but it's not necessarily, uh, one of those ones that, that's, that's brought up on a regular basis. And so Luke chapter 17, you guys find it, say amen if you're there. All right, look down at verse 7 and let's read it together in verses 7 through 10. Jesus speaking here, of course, says, Will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. That's challenging, right? This is, this is, this is a challenging little story. Again, the issue is not whether we will serve, but where we will serve. And so I want to give you guys tonight four servanthood standards that we see in this, in this story that Jesus told. The first one is this, serving is not always spectacular. <laughs> and, and, and anyone who served, I think you, you know this and understand this. Serving is not always spectacular. Look at the first part of verse 7. Jesus asks a question. He says, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep? Now the word that Jesus uses here in this parable for servant is the Greek word doulos. It's often translated bond servant. Basically what this is, is a servant who is attached to an owner. And Jesus' listeners would have understood this and they would have related this to, to, to this parable because about 15 to 30 percent of the entire population in the first, first century were these kind of bond slaves, these servants. And so in this particular story here, we see this farmer who probably only had one servant 
who had to do m- multiple tasks throughout the day. He, he, he'd do the back-breaking work of plowing and then kind of the, the tiresome job of watching the sheep. And so he would, he would come in and, and he was probably tired, exhausted, his muscles are probably aching. And then, you know, he, he may have spent some time just being completely bored out in the field watching the sheep. And then the next day, what would he get up and do? Same thing, right? He would do whatever the master called him to do. And he'd do some of this, this hard physical work and some of this, maybe this boring work. And, and some of you, maybe you've had some of these experiences, right? Maybe you've worked a job and it's a physical job and you're tired, or maybe you've worked a job and it just doesn't seem to be stimulating to you mentally or physically or whatever. But my guess is over time, this servant in the story, his daily responsibilities became routine and his tasks just were not very exciting or thrilling. Once in a, once in a while, if you are reading through different headlines or news, you see a you see articles about how so many people in our country hate their jobs. You guys ever seen that? It, it pops up pretty regularly because I think it's a pretty common issue. Um, but I, I, I saw one uh, a while back. This was before the pandemic. But it said that uh, a, mo- a majority of Americans had mentally checked out from their jobs. <laughs> they, they had mentally checked out. And the poll that came out, it was a Gallup poll, and it said uh, that uh, 7 out of 10 workers had checked out at work or were actively disengaged. And only 30% were engaged, involved, and enthusiastic about uh, their workplace. Um, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know if what's going on in our country over the last year has changed that, but I think there's always going to be a certain amount of people, right, who've just kind of checked out at work. And I think as a side note, there's, I think, some Christ followers, some Christians who have kind of checked out from serving. And again, I know things are different right now and there's not as many places and, and, and certainly within the church there's a lot of these service opportunities that, that just aren't there right now, but we still have an opportunity to serve Christ, to, to shine for Christ. And we can still do work for Him as an act of worship, whether it's you know, in our homes or, or in our schools or wherever God happens to take us. And so when we do that, if we're, if we're shining for God, we're going to stand out, Right? We're going to be a little different. And when people see this, they will be drawn to the Savior who's in us and whom we're serving. And we'll be given these opportunities to, to, to tell them about why we're different and who we're serving. Listen, this word spectacular, right? When we say that, that serving isn't always spectacular, the word spectacular means thrilling or impressive. And sometimes serving is not very spectacular, because we're called to be faithful in some pretty ordinary task. Serving can involve exertion. Sometimes it can cost us a price. My parents served God for over 36 years in a, in a country where there is very little interest in the gospel, let alone spiritual things just in general. And I heard them tell me many times over the years that their ministry wasn't always fun, but that They knew they were doing what God wanted them to do and and that he gave them a joy because of that. And there were many, many difficulties along the way, but they were steadfast. They They continued to serve even in the times where it just wasn't exciting, it wasn't spectacular, it wasn't sensational. Sometimes we, I think... In churches, we try to recruit people into certain ministries and we, you know, I think we make a mistake sometimes of telling them, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be fun, it's, it's, it's going to be easy. I, I've actually heard that sometimes in, in relation to youth ministry. I've actually had people tell me um, in the last decade that, oh man, you're, you're in youth ministry. That, that's barely even in really real ministry, right? It's just fun most of the time, right? Just the fun stuff. And, and, uh, and listen, we, <laughs> I think we need to, kind of change that perspective in general serving is is strenuous it's it's not always spectacular when 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 you're sitting across from a teenager who finds no value in their life who 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 wants to check out from this world because their parents told them that they don't matter and they just can't seem to be able to withhold the pain anymore. Listen, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's hard. It's, it's, it's one of the furthest things from fun that I could think of. 
But then when through God's power a life is transformed, it brings joy. When I have to go to a hospital because a teenager has passed away, and I have to try to figure out what I'm going to tell the loved ones, it's excruciating. But when I see someone grasp what God has done for them through Jesus Christ and, and, and start to, to, to serve Him and to live for Him, it's, it's, it's so amazingly satisfying. Listen, we, we need to understand that, that there's times when serving is going to be painful, but there's times when it's going to bring great joy. I've actually seen some pastors urge people to, to, to serve, promising them that it'll make them happy. Listen, we, 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 we can't sugarcoat the Savior and, and the life of servanthood. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. There's, there's really no way around it. If we live sold out for Christ, we're, we're saying no to self, and, and when we serve, we're giving up all of our rights. And there's going to be some pushback. There, there, there's going to be some opposition. There's going to be some difficulties. And we need to understand that when we step into that arena, when we serve Christ fully, our work is not always going to be spectacular. And sometimes it's going to require great effort and great perseverance. It's not always spectacular. Secondly, guys, what I want you to see is that it needs to be sustained. Serving is to be sustained. Notice in our, in our story, in our parable, after working all day, the servant comes back to the master's house. He's probably tired, he's probably hungry, but he still has work to do. And so here's the principle. A servant's service may change place and the specific job description may be in flux, but the truth of the matter is, is that our serving must be sustained. It really doesn't have a specific beginning point and end point. The, service is, the issue is not whether we will serve, but where we will serve. Actually, the job description for a servant is very simple and straightforward. The job description is this. Do everything your master commands. Do what, guys? Everything your master commands. Let me share a little story about my grandparents. My grandparents, um, who went to be with the Lord a few years ago, uh, when my grandfather was, was in his early 90s and my, my grandmother was just a few years younger, she I uh, had Alzheimer's and it, it continued to progress and get worse. And, and my grandfather, who was, again, in his mid-90s, had a hard time really taking care of her. And, and so the, the, the family kind of made a decision that they needed more help. And they were kind of all by themselves up in Minnesota and there wasn't any family nearby. And so they, they, they weren't able to drive anymore. They weren't really able to take care of their house anymore. So, so, so my dad and one of his brothers went up and sat down with them and said they really wanted to find a place where, you know, my grandmother specifically could, could get the care that she needed. And, and so they talked about, you know, packing everything up and, and selling the house. And it was, it was, it was a difficult time. And, and, you know, listen, that's, that's hard news, right? That, for anyone. But do you want to know what my dad said? My grandparents' number one concern was? Their number one concern wasn't, you know, where are we going to go? It wasn't that, you know, they were going to be moving away from their house. It wasn't that they were going to have to get rid of a lot of their stuff. They were actually both still teaching Sunday school classes at church, and both of them immediately were most concerned about their classes and who was going to teach them. <laughs> that, was, that was their number one concern. Into, into his 90s, my grandfather was, was teaching. I mean, that's, that's sustained service. Uh, and, and that's what I think God is asking us to do. And so let's listen to how Jesus said it in the second half of verse 7. Look at this verse with me. And then into verse 8. He said, Will anyone say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Notice here that the servant moves from outdoors to indoors, right? The day moves from, from daylight to dusk, from hard labor to home life. He goes from fields to fixing food. But what I want you to see, the truth that I want you to understand is that a servant serves whenever, wherever, for whomever, doing whatever it takes for however long it takes. I heard the story of a little girl who may or may not have been one of my girls. Um, 
But she finally learned to tie her shoes, right? Everybody here learned to tie her shoes? All right, good. Most of you. A couple of you still working on it. All right, so she finally learned to tie her shoes. and, And instead of being excited, she was overcome with tears. And her dad, who may or may not have been me, bent down and asked her why she was crying. And she said, because I have to tie my shoes. And the dad said, well, you just learned how, so now you can, you can do it. It's, it's not a sad thing. And, and the little girl responded, I, I know, but I'm really sad because now I have to do it myself for the rest of my life. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the idea, right? I mean, that's a, that's a deep realization for a little kid. Listen, um, but one pastor said it this way, comfort precedes collapse. Guys, listen. The point I think that Jesus is trying to get across is if you're alive, you're to be a servant. The location and the intensity of your serving may change as the seasons of your life change, but no Christ follower has the option of of sitting down and just saying, I'm done, and, and, and just waiting for his or her needs to be met when there's still things to do for the kingdom. I think we could maybe 21st century eyes it this way and say, listen, it's not break time yet, Right? It's not break time. We talk a lot about serving opportunities in the church, but but we're actually going to be serving all the time. 17th century pastor Matthew Henry said that we we must make this. He said, the end of one service, the beginning of another. When we have been working for God, we must still wait on God continually. And so the key is really to be a servant and not a slacker. Man, I'm I'm so moved by the caliber of the committed servants that, that we have here at this church. I've been to quite a few different churches over the course of my life, and, and I've seen some, some really great dedicated servants, and then some, some who just kind of, you know, are just kind of in and out. But, but we have some who've been here for, for such a long time, serving so selflessly. And, and, and again, I understand we're in a different time than usual, and some of the normal service opportunities aren't, aren't necessarily available right now, but I had someone just this last Sunday say, listen, I... I I want to do something. What is available? I know there's a lot of things that aren't, but what is available? And that's the mindset, right? I mean, we have some people who who I know have served through their cancer treatments. We have people who have retired from their their jobs so that they can spend more time serving at the church. We've we've had people who've been in in our nurseries and our Sunday school classes for decades. Listen, that's what what Jesus is talking about. And, and, And many of these people that I've seen are an inspiration to me. And I I hope to be as faithful as the many dedicated saints that we have in this church. Listen, serving is not always going to be spectacular. There's times where it's exciting and it's thrilling and there's times where you just have to do what's in front of you. Serving must also be maintained and sustained because the issue is not whether we're going to serve but where we're going to serve. Thirdly, what I want you to see is serving as a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. After going all out and working from sunup to sundown, the servant is no doubt tired, right? And probably a word of appreciation would have meant a lot to him. But it doesn't come. Look at verse 9. Look, look, look at the question that Jesus asks here. Does he thank the servant, speaking of the master, because he did what was commanded? And the implied structure here of of this question in the Greek is that it's a strong no. It's a question that's structured in such a way that the only only possible answer is no. It's a strong negative in the Greek. The word thank here means to have gratitude or to be grateful. And so the idea is is that if the master expresses gratitude, it could be construed as a debt that must somehow be settled to, to even the score. And this really, if, if, if we understand our, our position, if we understand who God is and who we are, this is absurdly arrogant. Job points this out in Job 22 too. He says, can a man be of benefit to God? We can't impress God in such a way that he will somehow feel obligated to give us some kind of special honor or thanks. Does that make sense? Some of us, I think, and some Christians throughout our country think that, that God somehow owes them for all that they've done for him. Listen, God doesn't favor us especially because we've done something special. We're servants. And therefore, we must serve and do what the Master commands us to do. 
If you remember the Pharisees, right? You guys remember the Pharisees in the Gospels? The Pharisees did all these things. They believed that their deeds put God in their debt. And this kind of thinking is dangerous and it gets us into deep trouble because God doesn't owe us anything. In fact, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, God doesn't owe us, God owns us. That's what he says. Paul says, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Listen, we're not entitled to a word of thanks or appreciation. Our focus, I think, is often on our feelings. Whereas a servant was focused on doing the job. I think oftentimes, you know, we, we serve kind of with some kind of expectation. And we, or maybe with a wrong motivation. And then we get frustrated or angry and, and, and determine that we're not going to do this again because, you know what, no one thanked me or I didn't really get appreciated for, for doing what I was doing. Listen, we need to remember that God does not need us to serve Him, right? It's our duty and it's our delight and He is under no obligation to reward us. I think we live in a culture where we're consumed with our our own rights, but Christ followers are, are not to have an attitude of entitlement that leads us to think we have a right to certain benefits or privileges, Listen, God isn't some kind of vending machine that just dispenses blessings whenever we kind of push the right buttons on that vending machine, right? He doesn't just give us blessings for our good behavior. We need, we need to reject that, that kind of mechanical, unbiblical faith that says, if I do A, then God's going to do B for me. That's not, that's not what's going on. That's not what Jesus is talking about here in this story. We need to get this point straight that God created us for his glory right you guys understand that God created us for his glory as a matter of fact listen to Romans 11 35 and 36 Paul says or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him to God be glory forever amen and so let me let me let me just clarify something now I don't think It's wrong to show appreciation when someone is serving, right? As a matter of fact, I think we need to do more of that. And I make it a point here, you know, within the youth ministry at our church to to thank those who serve in the ministry as often as I can. I think many people, including myself, can can get discouraged. And and a word of encouragement can go a long way. I've I've had a couple people do that for me just in, in in the recent past, and it was so uplifting. Hebrews 3.13 says that we are to encourage each other every 24 hours, actually. The author says, but exhort one another every day. How often, guys? Every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so as as, as kind of a, a side note or side question, let me ask you this. Have you encouraged somebody today? Who have you encouraged today? Listen, you still have, you know, maybe two, three hours left, right? If you haven't, you still have an opportunity to encourage someone. And so I'm not saying we, we, we shouldn't thank people, we shouldn't encourage people, but as the servant, we shouldn't necessarily expect it, right? Serving is a, is a sacrifice, and we need to understand that and know that. And there's going to be times when, when maybe it's, it's not seen by other people. But let me tell you, it is seen by the one who matters, right? Who's that? By God, right? And so serving is not always going to be spectacular, but we need to make sure that it's sustained and that we understand that it can be a sacrifice. But then there's one more serving standard that I want you to see, and those three maybe might be seen a little bit on on the negative side, but this one's certainly on the positive side, and that's that serving is satisfying. It's satisfying. And so Jesus wraps up this story that he told, this short story, I think with some corrective words in verse 10. To those who are caught up in, in, in me and myself and I. Look at what Jesus says. He says, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have done what was our duty. And so notice that in the first part of the parable, we're called to identify with the master. But now we see these words, So you also. And so we're to see our identity as servants. My guess is here that Jesus speaking to the disciples, 
wanted them to, to, to understand that, that they weren't any better than anybody else, right? They maybe, if you remember, like to think of themselves as, as entitled masters, but not necessarily as unworthy servants. This, and so this verse, I think, helps them and us to see what being a servant involves. A servant's heart is intent upon and his will is bound to the will of and wishes of another. Let me say it this way, and, 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 and one pastor put it this way, regardless of how much we do, we cannot do more than is expected of us. And so can we really say that we've done, as Jesus said, all that we were commanded? All that we could have commanded. And so really what we need is, I think, a change of perspective, right? We need to, instead of having a feeling of entitlement, we need to see ourselves as unworthy servants. The idea here in the Greek is that we are unworthy of any praise. Unworthy of any praise. Warren Wearsby, the former pastor of Moody Church, who's now gone to be with the Lord, he put it this way. He said, no one owes me anything extra. God doesn't owe me anything extra. It's like when, when, when we pay our taxes. Now, a bunch of you probably haven't had to do that yet, right? Those of you who are working, maybe you've filed taxes, but... But when we file our taxes with the government, we don't receive a thank you note from the IRS, do we? <laughs> Get a note in the mail from the IRS that says, thank you for filing your taxes. No, it's expected of us, right? It's, it, it's our duty as citizens. We don't get anything from, from the IRS. We've simply done what was expected of us. And so likewise, we shouldn't expect an extra reward from God for expected services or service. We're, we're to recognize... We're to recognize that, that honestly, guys, it's a privilege to serve Him. And, and, and that really we are unworthy to be used by Him for His kingdom and for His purposes. And so I, I want to encourage you guys to think of it this way. The Lord of glory, right? The Almighty God of the universe has you in His service. Think of that for a second. Have you ever taken a moment just to think that through? And so in, in, in that sense, when, when your, your, your mind is reframed in that way, serving is so very satisfying because it's an honor and it's a privilege to serve the king of the universe. And so guys, when I've had trouble, when I've had difficulty to, to really just kind of have that servant mindset. I, I've, I've been reminded of Samuel over in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you remember, God was, was calling out to him and, and he didn't really understand. And so he, he went to see Eli and, and did it a couple times. And eventually, eventually, Eli told him what to say. And so God called him on him again. And he said, if you remember, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You guys remember that? And there's been times where I've had to reframe my mind and, 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 and my motivation and, and my desires and, and, and to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I want to do whatever it is you call me to do, wherever it is you call me to do it, for however long you want me to do it. Listen, our society seems to be obsessed with, with help, helping people develop their self-esteem and Improving self, but, but Jesus is much more concerned that we understand ourselves to be unworthy servants. In Mark chapter 10, verses 35 and 37, we see that, that James and John, these, these two disciples who weren't just disciples, they weren't just in the, in the 12, but they were even in that kind of special group of three, right? Peter, James, and John, and, and so they got to accompany Jesus on a couple times when even the other, the other nine disciples didn't go. And so they had even a hard time seeing themselves as servants. They, they, they asked this question in, uh, in this account in Mark 10. They said, teacher, we want, to do, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> now, now, think of this, right? <laughs> these, these two brothers are coming to Jesus, the God of the universe, and saying, hey, we want you to do right now whatever we tell you. That's, that's basically what they're saying. We want you to do for us whatever we ask you. And then they go on to say, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in, in your glory. Now, we get to learn from them here because their perspective was all wrong, right? They were all about serve us, not service. 
They, 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 they wanted the status. They didn't want the servanthood. They wanted to be seen as superstars, not as slaves of the Savior. They wanted these place, these places of, of glory and honor and, 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 and not to, to, to serve. And so Jesus reset the perspective and the standard when he said in verse 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Listen, if that was Jesus' perspective, right? If that's what Jesus came to do and accomplish, and, and, and he's Almighty God, then certainly we as unworthy sinners who've been saved by grace can say the same thing, that, that we don't want to come to be served, but to serve. Lauren Sandy, who was the founder of Navigators, was once asked how we can really know that we have the attitude of a servant. And I think his answer was to the point, but I think it's something to think about. He said, you know you're a servant by how you act when you're treated like one. <laughs> you ever think about that? Some of you are like, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, when you're treated like a servant, do you get offended? When someone forgets to say thank you, do you get upset and say, oh, I'm not doing that again? Do you think you're worthy of recognition do you, or do you say, you know what? I've been treated better than I should be treated because I'm an unworthy servant. As a matter of fact, what I do deserve is an eternal punishment, right? So getting to serve the Savior, uh, just uh, out of gratitude for Him and love for Him for all that He's done to me is, is just an amazing privilege. Listen, guys, when, when you boil it down, when you strip everything away, it really comes down to obedience, Right? Now, I know that's a word that probably is a difficult word. It was difficult for me when I was a teenager. I still stumble over it sometimes. <laughs> but it really comes down to obedience. There have been times where I've asked my girls to, to move back from a busy road or from a ledge or, or, or just really from dangerous situations. And, and, and they've, they've said, oh, Dad, I'll be careful. And my answer is this. Listen, I'm not asking for carefulness right now. I'm asking for obedience, <laughs> Right? And, and, and I think that's what, what we need to understand. God's asking for obedience. Listen, the master knows what's best for us. And we as his servants are to do our duty out of devotion for him. It's about obedience. And so the question real, really boils down to, will you obey the master? Understanding that, that listen, serving is not always spectacular. It's something that's expected to be sustained. It's a sacrifice, but it's so very satisfying when I was in college and I don't know if this was the case a couple decades later when you were there but when I was in college at Moody there was there was three letters and uh, they came up regularly they were the letters DTR which which stood for define the relationship Um, and these were these were often difficult letters especially for guys Uh, but they were used pretty frequently, and basically what, what, what they meant and what would happen is, you know, a girl and a guy would, would like each other, you know, they'd give each other that look every once in a while across the classroom, and, you know, then maybe one would say, hey, you want to go get coffee or something, and so maybe they go get coffee, and they spend a little time together, hey, you want to study in the library together, you know, okay, we'll go, let's go study together in the library, and, but then they would get to this point, right, where they would have this dreaded DTR, and they would ask, you know, what is this relationship and, and where is it headed and, and uh, you know, where do we stand together? Are we moving on towards dating and marriage or, or are we just, you know, what many of the guys would, would, would fear and dread, you know, the just friends. We're just friends, right? Uh-huh. It's two words that could bring dread into the ears of any guy who thought maybe it was more anyways or maybe you know i know that's bad but or maybe the whole you know maybe we just need to call it off altogether whatever this is or was right so there's a time i tell you this because there is a time where i think it's necessary to define the relationship And, and and so how do we define our relationship when it comes to god and i think this is something that's that's so incredibly important that we get straight God is our master. 
God is our master and, and I and you have no rights before him. He is right and has all the rights and alone is righteous. And so as we look even to our world, the Supreme Court isn't, isn't supreme. He is the Supreme Court of the universe. And all his rulings are just. And so we need to get on our knees before him and repent, I think, sometimes of our weak view of God. And that's what Isaiah did, if you remember, when he caught a glimpse of the holiness of God in Isaiah chapter 6. That's what Ezekiel did. That's what Job did when he repented of his arrogant questioning when he said in, in Job 40 verse 4, Behold, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. These people who, who came into some kind of presence of God understood in those moments that in comparison to God that they were nothing, they were dirt, that they were unworthy. Listen, the Almighty God doesn't exist to serve us. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29 calls us to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And notice these words, which people don't necessarily like to quote a lot, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire, and so we're to serve Him with reverence and with godly fear. And so guys, let me just... Let me just ask as we kind of start to wrap this up, how do we, what do we do with this? How do we apply this? And so let me give you just briefly two quick ways tonight. Firstly is this, and most importantly, surrender to the Savior. Surrender to the Savior. Listen, the first and most important thing in the first place to start is to make sure that you are saved and that you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as your, as your master. That's really what Lord means. And listen, for, for some people, for, for, for people that I've talked to in the past, that's their stumbling block. It's not that they, they don't believe they're a sinner, they understand that. It's not that they don't know that they need a Savior, they, 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 they realize that. But it's that they want to be Lord of their own life. They don't want another master. They don't, they don't want to submit. They don't want to surrender. And so they decide not to receive Jesus into their life. Listen, if you haven't done that, that, that's the first and most important step. But after you surrender, after you realize all that you've been forgiven, after you realize all that Christ has done for you, listen, you will want to serve Him. Not because you have to, but because you get to. You'll want to live as a servant because you love Jesus as your Savior. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, The more we get what we now call ourselves out of the way and let Jesus take over, the more truly ourselves we become. And so we need to make sure that our time, our, our talents, and our treasures are at disposal of the Master to use for whatever He wants. And so the first application step, guys, the first way to live this out is very, very simply surrender to the Savior. But secondly, we need to choose. We need, there needs to be a decision of the will to be a servant and not a volunteer. Listen, there's a difference between choosing to serve and choosing to be a servant. And so we could say it this way. Don't serve until you've settled the servant, servanthood issue. But once you've settled that, once you've realized who God is, what He's done for you through Jesus Christ, and that He wants to use you for His kingdom and for His purposes, then don't stop serving. And so the question really is, in what ways can you serve in 2021? Listen, again, I don't know what this year has in store. Do any of you guys? (laughs) I don't know when we'll be back over in the youth building. I don't know when we'll have a meal, small groups. I don't know when Sunday schools will be back. I don't know any, I don't have answers to any of those questions, even though people continue to ask them of me. I don't know, you know, when some of these other service opportunities are going to come back in the church, but I know you can serve in your home. I know that God can use you there. I know that he can use you in your neighborhood. I know he can use you wherever else you happen to be in the community. And that you can serve him and that you can be a light and that he has a plan for you this year, no matter what this year has in store. If you're available to him, right? And so in what ways can you serve in 2021? Listen, I'm excited. I, I have a couple words that I like to use on mission trips and um, 
you know, we, we plan our mission trips as best we can, and we, we, whether we're doing camps or whether we're doing other ministries, we, we try to have everything lined up so that we can do it, you know, with excellence. But so many times those plans change, especially when you go to a place like Africa. A lot of times you just have to throw the plan out the window because it's just not going to happen. But with that come these two words that I like to use, this, this adventurous expectancy. That, that, that when we, we don't know what's coming, when, when our plans go out the window, when we don't know what's around the corner, you know what? We can be adventurously expectant because God is going to do something. God is going to work. And it's so many times on, on, on mission trips and, and here at CBC and all kinds of other places, when, when the script has kind of gone out the window, when the plans have kind of been tossed, God has shown up in amazing ways to do amazing things because that was his plan from the beginning. We just didn't know it. And so there's this, this expectancy that, you know what, we know God is at work, we know God is working, we know where he's in control, we know his sovereign will is going to be accomplished, and if he chooses to use us in order to do those things, it's going to be so very exciting and satisfying, right? And so we, we go into this year available and willing for God to use us and just adventurously, adventurously expected that, that, that we may not know what that's going to look like. But that if he chooses to work his will and his way through us, it's going to be amazing. And so we're not just some volunteers who are going to fill in some slots on a sign-up sheet, right? We're servants who are going to live a lifestyle of doing whatever God wants us to do. Many of you guys have probably learned about David Livingstone, right? He served in Africa as a missionary for 33 years. I mean, he was really a pioneer in, in, in what he did. And when he came home to England, people tried to applaud him and, and award him and give him these accolades and, and, and call him some kind of superstar servant. But I want you to listen, about, listen to how he viewed himself and, and what he said about himself. Because I think he had the right perspective. He said, for my own part, I have never ceased to rejoice that God has appointed me to such an office. People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called a sacrifice which is simply paid back as a small part of a great debt owing to our God which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward and healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. I say rather it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering or danger now and then with a foregoing of the common conveniences and the comforts of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment because all of these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall be revealed in and for us. And then he closed. I never made... A sacrifice. See, it was all about his perspective. Even through the difficulties and, and the trials and what this world would see as sacrifices, he said, it was an absolute honor and privilege to serve God and to be used by God. To allow the Master to work in me and through me For his kingdom and purposes. What about your life? What would you love this year to see God do in and through you? How would you love and and, and feel privileged and honored and humbled for the master to call you to be a part of, to do, to serve? Listen, I hope that as God looks down at our church, as he looks down at our youth ministry and front lines, that he sees sincere servants sold out for the Savior who are equipping others to reach their full potential in Christ. That's God's desire, right? Jesus gave us the great commission to go into all the world. He gave us the great commandment to love the Lord your God and our neighbor is ourself, and to be available. In order to do either of those, we have to be available 
to be used by God. And it really comes down to this perspective. That we are these unworthy servants. And because of that, it is such a great privilege and a satisfying experience to serve God as a way of life. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for these words of Christ, this, this short but challenging story. God, we, we like to be thanked. We like to be encouraged. We like to, to be needed and, and, and valued. And, and, and God, those aren't necessarily all bad things. But God, I pray that you would help us to have the right perspective. That we would understand that that you are the master and we are your servants. And so when we when we introduce ourselves, God, when we when we find our identity, that we would that we would echo the words of Paul and, and James and Titus and all those Old Testament saints. That we would say, I am Drew, a bondservant of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is who I am. And so that is what I will do. God, whatever it is you call me to do, wherever it is you call me to do it, for however long you choose for me to do it, God, that I would be available, that I would be ready, that I would consider it a privilege and a joy, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it may be or what trials may come that you would work in us, God, the the strength, the courage, the perseverance, the determination to do your will and to be your servants. God, I pray that we wouldn't do it expecting recognition or thankfulness, but I pray that we would look for those opportunities to encourage those around us, to spur each other on, to to thank those who, who are serving faithfully. And when it's all said and done, God, not, may we not desire to hear that we've gained some kind of accolade or some kind of reward, but that we've been faithful. That we may hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. God, I for one am so grateful that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for me. So God, out of the gratitude that's in our hearts, out of the thankfulness, out of the love that we have for for Christ and for what he's done for us, may we, this year and in the coming years, simply be willing to serve the master. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. I know... I know we started uh, with a serious, <laughs> a serious story and parable, and, and again, it's it's challenging, but that's that's good. Um, I do have small group questions. I don't. I was going to ask you guys if uh, I know last semester we were we were posting them and, and allowing you guys to kind of pull them up or print them out as you see fit. Is that still useful? Do we need? To, should we continue doing that? Just yes, no, maybe indifferent. Or the other option I can give you is I can print them out if you guys want to. I know uh, if you want to take them home with you, like some, you know, the normal sheets that you maybe see. If that is that more helpful? Okay, all right. So, so I'll do that. Um, I have one here tonight, but I can get them if you want. If you want them, you're welcome to have them. Uh, so, if anyone wants that, and I'll print a few every week. And so, if you want to take the small group questions home with you, maybe I know. Uh, maybe if you have a tangible, physical copy, you're more likely to to look through the questions or go through them with your families, um, family discussion questions as opposed to small group questions in our current context. Um, anyways, so I'll, I'll do that. And so there's one copy. If you want one, let me know. I'll shoot you shoot you an email or print one out for you. You can grab this week or next week. Um, we're going to continue, guys, as I said, over the next few weeks to look at some of the parables. And, um, you know, some of them are longer, some of them are shorter, some of them are more familiar, others are not. But they're all, I think they're all challenging to an extent, right? As Jesus, as Jesus teaches us some very important truths that, that really all have very practical application. And so, um, so I encourage you guys, just maybe this week, uh, in the coming days, just maybe ask God that through this series he would 
show you some very practical things that, that you can uh, take and, and put into practice in your lives. Make sense? Sound good? All right, guys. Thanks again for coming tonight. Appreciate you all. Have a uh, great week. Stay safe. I know, uh, I know things with this virus are kind of seeming to grow right now. Um, but, uh, but again, God is in control. So let's, let's continue to, to trust him and look for those opportunities that he gives us to, uh, to serve wherever he has us. All right. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys, for coming. Appreciate you all. Have a great week.